Awesome. Hi, everyone. Really great to be here today. So our presentation will be about content security policy. Uh, this is Michele. I'm Lucas. We both work at Google in Zurich. Uh, we are a part of a special focus area that deals with uh, uh, promising mitigation techniques and proactive projects to mitigate whole classes of bugs. And content security policy is actually one of them. And we spent a lot of time the last year on content security policy. We learned a lot and we wanted to share some of that with you guys. So a uh, very brief recap before we start. Uh, I just wanted to ask you guys, who of you has worked with a content security policy before even like audited or you know, put it on the side? Cool, some people have, awesome. Uh, who of you know what the nonce-based uh, policy is, like with nonces or with strict dynamic? One? Okay, two. So I think it's very good to have a recap and uh, re briefly repeat what happened the last nine <laughs> Sorry, was that me? No. <laughs> um, so basically, we have been here already last year, and we were mostly talking about uh, how to bypass whitelist-based CSPs. We did a pretty big research uh, on all content security policies we could find in the Google search index, and it turned out that most content security policies were used for mitigating XSS, which makes sense, because this is why we have CSP mostly, right? Uh, in addition to that, we also evaluated the security of these policies, and it turns out that at this time, almost 94% uh, of the whitelist-based policies uh, were completely bypassable automatically, like all the policies from the web, right? Which is pretty bad if you think of it, right? It takes a lot of time to come up with a whitelist-based policy to refactor your application to make it work, and then you're actually getting not really a lot of benefit. So we actually propose to use non-spaced policies instead of whitelist-based policies because they can offer uh, significantly more security guarantees. And uh, in addition to that, we also proposed uh, strict dynamic, which went into the CSP free spec recently, uh, which kind of makes the non-space policies actually, build, actually workable in, in practice. So if you want to learn more about like this previous research, like why whitelist-based security, uh, whitelist-based uh, CSPs are not really uh, great, there is a really cool paper we presented at the CCS in Vienna last year. Uh, uh, provides a lot of information on that. So, uh, brief recap, how do non-space policies work? Uh, basically, you have a content security policy like that. You restrict the, the scripts that can be loaded, and you have a, runs, a nonce with a random value. This value needs to be random for every response, right? So the idea is, uh, the browser only executes script tags on a site if the script tag has a nonce attribute that matches this random value. So an attacker who found an XSS vulnerability cannot inject the script tag without knowing the nonce, right? And since he usually does not know the nonce, the browser will just refuse to execute the script. So this is the basic principle. In addition to that, non-space policies also have the big advantage that you don't have to come up with an application-specific whitelist, which can be a very tedious task if it's a big application, right? And these whitelists often even change after, over time, right? Which is like a big source of breakage. And yes, in addition to that, you also don't have to care about like whitelist bypasses like JSONP or Angular bypasses for whitelist because it's a non-space policy. So uh, how does this usually work? If you, uh, if you take this example, um, we have like a script with a nonce. This random nonce value is the same as in the policy. So the browser allows this inline script and this uh, source script to execute. It's all client side, right? Um, if you have an attacker and he injects the script tag uh, inline or sourced, it does not have the nonce attribute. So the browser says, no, uh, this cannot execute. Uh, the XSS is kind of mitigated. So uh, strict dynamic basically builds on top of that. It allows to dynamically propagate trust from nonce scripts to child scripts uh, with basically 
uh, DOM-based APIs like create element and append child. This is very important because many libraries, JavaScript libraries, uh, create dynamically JavaScript to, for example, for module loading or for JSMP and for this kind of stuff, right? So they don't propagate the nonce, so they kind of break if you don't have strict dynamic. So this is kind of a stepping stone to make this work uh, till most of the libraries have been refactored to you know, propagate the nonce manually. Uh, in addition to that, if you have strict dynamic in the policy, it also drops the whitelist. So if you have, for example, like a policy like this, and then here like google.com, strict dynamic would cause google.com to disappear because uh, if you would have google.com there as well, it would mean that a script could load if it has a nonce or a source from google.com, and we want to have it more strict, so we drop the whitelist. This is also very nice because then the policy is backward compatible, which I will show you in a second, and you can use the same policy for older and newer browsers uh, regardless if they support strict dynamic or not. So this is an example. Uh, the top green box is basically what is allowed by strict dynamic. Uh, the parent script is nonced, and since there's strict dynamic, it can create a new script and does, can do a pen child, and this new script will also be allowed to execute. Uh, as I said, this pattern is very, this, uh, this pattern is very often used in, in libraries. Uh, on the other hand, parser inserted stuff like document write or inner HTML is not blessed because that's usually a very big source of, you know, XSS. Um, so that was the recap. I want to share some of our experiences with like deploying a strict CSP at Google at many, on many big products. Um, it's actually really cool because in the last nine months, a team of about like four full-time equivalent people were able to roll out a strict CSP uh, to like almost a billion users. And uh, in total, like so far in nine months, like 150 services, which is really a lot, right? Because with the whitelist-based approach, you usually needed something between like, I don't know, three and four, four, five people for two years to refactor the application, to come up with the whitelist, to maintain it, right? And um, with the non-space policies, this is actually much simpler. So it scales very well. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, we're also monitoring CSP violations which we're receiving, right? Every time the browser blocks something, it sends back a violation report to let the developer know that there might be something broken, right? So per day, we receive about 50 million CSP reports. It's a lot, right? Um, so it either means like all our applications are broken uh, or that there's a lot of noise. So like spoiler alert, it's all noise. And this is actually a big problem for us because it makes it really hard to find out if you have some real breakage or if it's just, you know, noise. But we have a slide about that as well later. So a couple of services you may know that have a strict CSP already deployed are uh, Google Photos, uh, you know, Google Plus, accounts at google.com, passwords at google.com, like the sensitive domains, and uh, many more. So there is a couple of requirements that need to be met to actually roll out CSP at that scale. And uh, we wanted to share these with you. Maybe that's also useful for uh, if you want to roll out CSP at, at your company or privately, right? Um, so what really helped us a lot is baking strict CSP into the core frameworks, right? So that all new services that are built on the core frameworks will have it by default. Uh, without the developer having to do anything. And uh, the existing services built on the core frameworks could be opted in uh, after they have been tested uh, by just switching a flag. So this was the case for Google+. Plus. We just had to switch a flag to get strict CSP enabled and it worked, right? Which is really nice compared to whitelist-based policies because it takes a long time to get them work for almost no benefit. So. The, the culprit is here that there's some requirements for this to actually make CSP deployments that easy. And um, the probably most important one is that you have to have like a service independent CSP. 
like one CSP that you can use for every service. And uh, that's uh, actually the nice thing about non-spaced CSP with strict dynamic. Uh, you can use the same CSP for all products, not even restricted to Google products, right? You can use that in general, which is really nice. Um, the next thing is conformance tests. You probably have not heard about that before. This is some special tests we run at Google to kind of prevent developers from submitting anti-patterns to the code base. And one of these conformance tests actually check that there is no inline event handlers in the HTML markup. And this was already here before we rolled out CSP, right? And it was very handy for us because CSP does not really work well with uh, inline event handlers. So uh, we did not have to refactor these applications because there were no inline event handlers, which is really great, right? Um, otherwise, you probably have to go through the templates and refactor them out into the JavaScript registered event handlers, right? Which is, depending on the application size, uh, usually a little bit more work. Um, and third, also very important, uh, we use templating systems at Google that allow auto nouncing of scripts. I have a separate slide on that, but a very prominent one is Clojure templates, which is also open source. And the TLDR is you can basically pass the nonce value for the response that you also use for the header at the central place to a templating system, and the templating system nonces all the scripts automatically for you, and you don't have to refactor a single HTML page, which is really handy. And of course, you need monitoring tools and other tools to support this rollout. Uh, so this is basically the, the policy we use almost everywhere. Um, as I said, this is not restricted to Google, but uh, it is really nice compared to the widely spaced policies. These strict non-spaced policies are kind of always look the same. Uh, the only thing you have to ensure is that your scripts are nonced and that you don't have inline event handlers, for example, right? Um, so this, the non scripts work. Uh, dynamically created scripts will work. Um, I will talk about this in a second. And we have fallbacks, unsafe inline and HTTPS. If you have an old browser that does not understand strict dynamic, like Edge, then it will just ignore this and will just execute that. And uh, the, the CSP is basically a no-op, but it will also not break your site, which is probably very important, right? Uh, Firefox or Chrome who understand CSP free, they will uh, drop unsafe inline and they will drop the whitelist. <coughs> so for them, the effective policy is actually a very useful secure policy. And it's also very important, uh, we have to add object source none and base UI none to prevent uh, uh, other sort of bypasses, which is usually not a problem for most applications. Uh, closure templates. So, there's a lot of, uh, there's a bit of magic here and I'm a really big fan of closure templates because they really make my life significantly easier. Um, basically, it's like a very simple templating language. You have parameters which get inserted here. Uh, also very important, it has like auto escaping. So it knows when user input goes into like a script tags that it has to escape it for a script context, right? If it goes into like HTML, tags and it knows that it has to escape it for the HTML context, which is very important, right? And on top of that, Clojure also works very well with uh, CSP. So there's an e example event handler. Uh, you don't have to understand the code, but it basically generates a random nonce. And this random nonce is set in the CSP header and it is also passed as, as metadata uh, to the templating system. You can do this like in one base handler, like in one central place, right? Not by every template. And then the result is actually very nice. It is, uh, you have basically every script nonced, although you have like no nonce in the template, right? The, the templating system completely takes care of it and uh, your site doesn't break because all the legend scripts have nonces and the user input is escaped properly for the right context which is important, right? Because like if you nonce a script and you have unescaped user input here, that could be uh, still lead, that could still trigger an XSS then, right? So uh, ship it, right? Uh, all good, awesome. Um, so problem is you maybe still break some functionality, some edge cases or something, right? Maybe there was a inline event handle which you forgot. 
So you basically need to roll out the policy in report only first and look at the violation reports that are sent back from the browser. Uh, so in theory, that sounds good. In practice, you will get like for big products like 10 million of CSP violation reports, right? And it's like, oh my God, everything is broken. But it turns out that most of these reports or almost all of these reports are actually noise. And the problem so far is that you cannot really distinguish between the noise of uh, actual breakage, uh, the, the violation reports of actual breakages and violation reports triggered by browser extensions. So uh, CSP3 has a really nice thing for that. It's a new keyword, it's called report sample. And it basically, when the report sample keyword is present in the policy, it basically instructs the browser to send like the first 40 bytes of the script that was blocked in the report back to the, uh, to the server. And with that, you can usually uh, learn a lot about the blocked script, right? And you can usually find out if it was a, a, a extension or not. Uh, Firefox has something like that uh, already for a very long time, although not for event handlers. And the new script sample kind of adds the whole thing to the spec and also covers the inline event handlers, which is nice, because then you would have, if you don't have that for inline event handlers, you have the same problem again. You don't know if the inline event handler was there in the first place in your application or if an extension injected it. So this will be hopefully part of Chrome 59. And uh, I just want to show you a brief example about the violation reports, how they usually look like. Uh, the first one here is like, you know, a normal inline, a normal inline script and the developer forgot to add a nonce. So it will be blocked and the browser will send a CSP report. Uh, it's a unsafe, uh, like blocked UI inline, uh, the document UI and it was a script source. Okay, you can deal with that, right? Uh, very similar for event handlers, right? You have uh, an inline event handler on load loaded, CSP blocks that, you get the report. It actually looks exactly the same as the previous report. Uh, as a developer, it's not optimal, but you know you have some breakage on your site and you probably have to find it. So the real problem is now extensions. They inject inline scripts like that and they also inject inline event handles like that. And if they do so, the browser will also send a violation. And the violation looks exactly the same as the other ones. So as a developer, you get like one million reports, like. 99.9% .9 are from Chrome extensions and it's really hard to, I mean, you don't know if you have a breakage or not, right? You always, always have this ground noise. Um, so three different causes of violations yield exactly the same report. Uh, with the script sample uh, keyword, this is different now. Uh, if you add it to the policy, you also get like the first 40 bytes of the script that was blocked. And this is actually really handy because you then can take this, this value and either search in your code base for it and confirm that it was actually your code, or you can build up uh, you know, signatures for uh, common extensions that inject stuff. So for example, uh, for some reason, AdGuard seems to inject uh, scripts into every single page you visit, and that's like, for example, counts one million of the noise reports, right? And there's like a really nice uh, GitHub page from Nico3333 FR that basically collects a lot of these signatures and you can just use them to filter your results and you know get some actually useful CSP reports. So uh, with that, I'll hand over to Michele who will talk about the tools we have uh, developed to roll out CSP at scale basically. Awesome. So. Um we have contributed to the content security policy specification. We uh, made it better. We added some keywords. We changed some behavior in a backward compatible way. Um, we deployed it to hundreds of products serving billions of users. But um, it is very hard to scale uh, at this uh, scale. And it's very important to build some infrastructure to, and tools to support uh, developers. Um, so, we developed, for example, an extension, which is what we call a CSP Mitigator, which is um, aimed at helping developers prototype a policy 
um, by just installing an extension, going to a website, seeing what would break and what needs to be changed in a website to adopt uh, strict CSP, which is our way of doing CSP, and uh, also providing guidance, uh, helping how to make uh, helping to make necessary changes. Uh, this uh, is uh, very useful because uh, when you want to deploy to several products, uh, you need to enable developers to uh, prototype policies uh, on their own. And uh, we have a short demo here. Um, so this is uh, Google Finance. Um, it's um, a product that does not have uh, CSP yet and is not CSP ready. This is mostly due to the fact that it has some legacy code and templating system. So it was not as easy to uh, enable CSP here. So this, is, this could be seen as a pretty complex web application uh, that a normal developer um, mm, wants to add CSP on. So uh, you have here a default strict CSP. Uh, and what you do, you click start and then you refresh the page. And then you see that there, there are some dotted red borders. Uh, these are the parts of the page that are triggering some CSP violations. And the green ones are inline event handlers or inline scripts. Uh, so we can play around a little bit like news. We see the same. Then let's do to the stock screener. Oh, this is very bad. We see a lot of, let's play around a little bit. Here, there is an inline event handler. We can see the green border. And um, basically, when we are done uh, playing around here, see, this was triggering with uh, inline event handler. So it's not breaking functionality. So this is actually a, a report-only policy, right? It's not enforcing, so it's not breaking the functionality. It's allowing you to exercise the user interface, but it's uh, at, at the same time even graphically showing you that there is something wrong and where. So uh, here there is a small counter. I don't know if you can see it, but it's saying 280. Uh, so it doesn't look very promising. Uh, we stop, and we have here a report. Uh, uh, we have here a report of script elements without announced attributes. So these kind of script, script blocks have to be announced, and they're not. So here, for example, we use uh, uh, some uh, Google Tag Services, which is some analytics tool, and uh, so on. Here we have uh, customer service. Here we have inline event handlers and JavaScript URIs. Mostly they are on-click. See, there is an on-click here. We can inspect more and so on. And basically, uh, there are some information, some suggestions, like uh, no CSP nonce has been detected, you should add nonces. No strict dynamic uh, has been detected, you should add it. Um, so this is a very uh, cool and uh, quick way to prototype policies. Uh, yeah, credits for that actually go to David Ross. And so, so. Then uh, we also have CSP Evaluator. Uh, we presented that already last time. It's a very easy tool to just put in your CSP and get back a result of, you know, if the CSP is actually a good mitigation against uh, XSS or not, because most wireless-based policies are broken, but there's also a lot of things you can get wrong with uh, non-space policies, right? So basically, uh, this is how the mitigator looks like. Uh, you can paste in a policy here, or you just type something, right? Twitter.com, and it tries to fetch it for you. Doesn't always work, but often it does. And then you get uh, the results, right? So, for example, in this case, uh, a whitelist-based policy is used, and a lot of hosts are whitelists that are known to host uh, JSONP, and all of any of the red ones can be used to bypass the policy, right? Uh, if you take, for example, uh, rocks.chromium.org, uh, you will see that there are like no known bypasses for that one, right? And there's also like sample policies and even uh, a Chrome extension, which basically does the same, but just evaluates the policy of every site and shows like a green or a red icon, depending if the site's policy is good or not. Um, yes. 
cool. Uh, so internally, we developed something, uh, a tool we call CSP Frontend for visualizing uh, CSP violation reports. So this is not a trivial task at all. Uh, I mean, from an infrastructural point of view, because there are so many, like 50 millions per day, but uh, mostly, uh, as Lucas uh, said earlier, because of the noise. Uh, most, uh, actually, the, the, the vast majority of the, of the reports we receive are noise. And uh, so it's very um, hard to have a, uh, a signal first view of what, what are breakages and what is just random extensions, uh, adding random scripts to, to the markup. So um, we had to come up with some um, strategies, for especially deduplication strategies, uh, that, for example, leverage script sample, uh, which is the extra bit of information for uh, inline event handlers and inline scripts uh, that we presented before, uh, because that's actually the most important signal we have. The, the majority of the of the violations we receive are inline viol inline script violations, and we don't know much uh, more if we don't have script sample. Why? While um, deduplicating even across uh, browsers across pages, across uh, domains, but uh, grouping by script sample, it is a much, much more uh, concise and useful view of reports. Um, we implemented uh, real-time filtering of violation report fields so that you can, for example, filter by a particular browser version, a particular violated direct a directive, and you see basically all the charts and everything updating in real time. Uh, again, it's, it's a lot of data, it's gigabytes of data, so it's not trivial to make it work client-side. And of course, if you want to drill down and actually see the single reports, non-deduplicated, uh, you can do that, you can do that, and you can investigate further. Um, so uh, here is how the CSP frontend looks like. Uh, at the top, you can see um, some uh, filters. So for example, you see um, um, some, um, well, uh, versions, browsers, violated directive, uh, block URI, document URI, and there are some operators such as contains and so on. So it's, it's a pretty advanced filtering uh, system. Then there is a high level view with some uh, charts of uh, like time charts or uh, basically the violations by uh, uh, violated directives. Then the top block URIs, uh, this can also help uh, understanding a little bit what's going on. And then there is a more detailed view of violation, which we'll see better in the next slide. Uh, I hope you can read it. Yes, should be pretty readable. So uh, basically, this is the aggressive deduplication uh, view. Um, uh, you can see uh, there are, uh, uh, well, so th this is the timestamp, this is the last document you write, this is paces.google.com, for example. Uh, here you can see, for example, a block you write, this is pstatic.davebestdeals.com. So we don't uh, source uh, scripts from davebestdeals.com at Google, right? So this is uh, probably an extension or, or some malware. Uh, and so we can safely ignore it. Uh, here we have some uh, Korean connect.facebook.com SDK. This is also probably an extension. Maybe add a like button to every page. Some kind of, some, something like that. Uh, also here, donationtools.org. It's very likely not us. And here it's a common CDN, which is we don't use by policy. So this is not us. So basically this is all noise, right? Uh, the sample you can see just here, an inline event handler. Actually, this is sent by Firefox, which is a little bit less fine-grained. So this uh, script sample uh, that they send uh, is just telling us which uh, event, inline event handler it, it is, but without the content of the uh, inline event handler. Uh, Chrome with report sample would send the actual JavaScript that is there. And finally, we have some high-level tools that are at the, our, let's say, uh, front-end server, which, I mean, it can be considered like a, a glorified reverse proxy. Uh, and we check for every HTML response we, uh, uh, we send out. And we check, uh, for example, for regressions. Uh, did we stop serving CSPs? Are we serving bad CSPs? Uh, are we serving unexpected CSPs? And there are some alerting uh, infrastructure, too. Uh, also, we integrated this with the CSP evaluator so that we can check uh, exactly what is a bad policy. Like, are we sending out a bad policy? Are some teams, for example, um, um, you know, writing a CSP from scratch uh, and sending out uh, an ineffective policy without realizing? Then, thanks to this uh, kind of uh, monitoring, we are able to find out. 
so uh, this was the, the engineering part, so what uh, we built to support the growth of CSP at Google, and we hope to uh, um, eventually open source some more tools. So uh, from what we said, the mitigator is on the Chrome Web Store. It's a Chrome extension. You can go there and use it, and we actually uh, really like uh, if, you, if you did and send us some feedback if you use it. Uh, also the evaluator, there is a link on the slide. Uh, it's, it's public, uh, it's very nice. Uh, the front end is an internal tool. It has a lot of internal dependencies, so we can't just open source it right away. Uh, but we are considering open sourcing it. Um, <coughs> and uh, now uh, I'd like to talk about some uh, recent uh, non-space CSP uh, bypasses. Uh, and how we are dealing with them. So, the first CSP by, uh, bypass, actually non-space CSP bypass that uh, we uh, uh, would like to, to talk about is basically if you just put script SRC nonce random and you have an injection, and in that injection you just put uh, base href evil.com. And then you have a non-script that has a relative source, such as x.js or foo slash var.js, and it is nonce. Um, the problem here is that the attacker is rebasing non-scripts to their own domain. So since we don't have a whitelist, but we are just relying on the blessing by the nonce, uh, scripts will execute because they have a valid nonce. So here the fix is to not forget to restrict base URI, so base URI none or base URI self, if we really uh, need to uh, set some base URI, uh, sorry, base href slash something, for example, as, as a shortcut. Um, uh, so a problem with base URI self is that in the pretty uncommon case in which you have a path-based open redirectors on your domains, uh, these can be bypassed. So you might say, why should you have a path-based open redirector, such as, I don't know, like slash redirect slash evil.com slash something, right? So nothing in the query, just in the path, and the server basically redirects to evil.com. Why should you have that? Well, at Google we have, and it's called AMP, Accelerated Mobile Pages. So uh, it was very problematic to uh, use self at Google, so we, opted, we um, uh, often opted for none or for a deep path. This, um, oh, uh, right, and the credit for this, uh, for this um, bypass goes to uh, Jack Massa. Um, the second bypass is uh, abusing uh, s mm, the uh, set tag of SVG for um, changing attributes of other elements. Um, so basically in uh, SVG, there is this concept of animatable uh, tags and um, there was a bug in Chromium that allowed to animate actually any, any tag, not just the animatable one. So this was really just a bug in Chromium. For example, it was not present in Firefox. So if you have an XSS and what you do, you, you enter the SVG context by doing SVG, and then you put a set tag that basically uh, instructs the browser to uh, um, modify the href attribute to data alloc one in this case. And then you have a, a legitimate script that was not in an SVG context, but now it is because it is an enclosed, uh, this is an enclosed SVG tag, right? Uh, so now this script tag is inside SVG content. Uh, basically SVG says, uh, okay, there is, uh, um, uh, uh, let, let's animate this to, and change it to this. So this was fixed in Chrome 58. Uh, this was just a bug, but it allowed for, for a bypass. And uh, credit goes to Eduardo Velanava for this. Now, uh, this is a category of, of bypasses which are uh, pretty interesting, in my opinion. And, it is, and they are all related to stealing and reusing nonces. So the, the whole idea, the whole foundation of nonces is that they are one time, they are unique per page load, and it is hard to reuse them. So even if you are able to steal them somehow, exfiltrate them, well, you can't reuse them without triggering a, a server-side page reload, and thus uh, the nonce has, has changed, right? So that's the idea. But how can you exfiltrate them in the first place? So you can do it with CSS3 selectors like this. So you force display block because of content. Well, this is a detail. The thing is, you have this operator, which, is, which means begins with, 
So here you're selecting scripts that have a nonce attribute that begins with A. And then what you do, you overwrite the content with record A, and then basically you exfiltrate character by character. And what you're able to do, you exfiltrate the nonce this way. So this alone, it, it doesn't give much because you also have to um, reuse them, right? Anyway, we'll see that later. There is another way of stealing uh, nonces, and it is via dangling markup attacks. Dangling markup attacks are actually nothing new. Uh, they uh, are known for several, ye several years. Uh, they are somehow a little bit hard to um, exploit in the real world because often they uh, need some very complex syntax. So for example, in this case, you have an injection and you inject a form and then an input and then a text area. So the text area is a like C data-like um, tag. So basically everything inside the text area is not parsed and it's considered basically C data. So like text, unparsed text. And basically you are able to get this script tag as content of the text area. So you can exfiltrate it and post it to your evil.com form. Okay, this is the idea. But as I said, it's very hard to reuse the nonce because in theory you have to uh, inject a script with the nonce you just stolen but in the same page, because you can't reload the page because the nonce would have changed, right? So you have to make the browser reload the original document without triggering a server-side um, re uh, re reload. So this is very hard, and uh, there are some very complicated edge cases with uh, exploiting HTTP cache, uh, which is like a server-side cache, or uh, uh, client-side uh, caches such as the back, back forward cache, which is a DOM cache. It is the cache that uh, uh, allows the browser to keep, for example, the state of the filled in forms when you hit back in your, the back button of your browser and you see that the form is still filled in. And uh, app cache is also something a little bit uh, exotic, so I, I won't go too much into detail. So one way is to have a frame and also um, um, inject a frame and have a history back. Uh, this would not trigger reload. Uh, in, and, and then there are some very peculiar cases that uh, have uh, different preconditions and constraints. So for example, if you have an XSS uh, due to data received by post message and you are polling and you're waiting for a post message, you have an on message and then you have a DOM XSS there, uh, well, then the page would have been refreshed, right? So this, you would be able to reuse the nonce. And, um, uh, yeah, so same if you have an XHR and you're waiting on the, uh, uh, on the uh, reply from the SSI, from the XHR. So how do we mitigate uh, these bypasses? So regarding the injection of base tags, well, the fix there is simply adding base URI none. And we did uh, uh, Google wide and we encourage uh, everyone to uh, restrict base URI if they use non-space policies. Replacing legitimate script SSC was a Chrome bug that was fixed, so that's all. Exfiltration, preventing exfiltration of nonce is a little bit more tricky, uh, and our solution, uh, our mitigation, is to not expose the, the nonce to the DOM at all. So um, basically, during parsing, the browser would uh, replace the attributes of, of scripts that, are, that have a nonce with replaced. So basically, this would keep the dot nonce web IDL property, but would remove the attribute. This means that CSS selectors can no longer s access the, uh, the property, and nothing else really can access the property. What about dangling markup attacks? So dangling markup attacks are uh, actually a long lingering problems, a problem in, in uh, web security. They really have not much to do with CSP, uh, because, for example, if you can exfiltrate parts of the markup, you can exfiltrate very sensitive data. You can exfiltrate, uh, you know, PIIs, you can exfiltrate tokens, you can exfiltrate very bad things. Um, but for uh, using dangling markup attacks to uh, um, bypass non space CSPs, well, the precondition is that you need some kind of parser inserted thing, such as document write, uh, to, uh, to it to be exploitable. So this, for example, does not play very well with strict dynamic. If you use strict dynamic document write uh, without, um, um, sorry about that, that was wrong. Uh, <laughs> um, so basically, this is a, a pretty restric restrictive precondition. Um, you need the document write uh, 
pre-existing in the page uh, where you, you can inject your, your student nodes. And uh, there is a proposal to forbid uh, parser instances syncs at all. So to forbid, for example, document write and, and company. Uh, uh, it is, uh, well, it will have to be rolled out at opt-in because we are basically disable, disabling uh, JS APIs. Uh, but uh, it is fully compatible with strict dynamic. Uh, so all the properties that have strict dynamic basically will have this extra protection for free. And furthermore, it would encourage best coding practices because document write is very bad. For example, uh, inner HTML is very bad. Uh, they are uh, bad for performance, they're bad for security. So you should not use them. Uh, we hope to be able to, to add this to the specification, maybe as an opt-in, uh, we'll see. It depends also a lot on the uh, industry support for, for this. So uh, here we are. I have a small demo on, thank you. Uh, so this is Google Plus. Um, uh, this is Google Plus. We have strict CSP on Google Plus. And um, as you can see, we have some scripts. And uh, we'll... Okay, so we do document, query selector all, script nouns. Well, let's just get the first one. Query selector script nouns. This means uh, get the first script with a nouns attribute. Uh, I think I can zoom. Yes. Uh, so uh, here it is, the nouns is replaced. So if I do get attribute nouns, it will say replaced. But if I access the JavaScript property, like .nonce, it will be there. And if I inspect the page source, okay, if I inspect the page source, uh, we see the nonce was, th was there, it was replaced at parsing time by the browsers, okay? So the idea is that CSS selectors can no longer steal them because it's not in the DOM anymore. And this is in Chrome Canary, so if you try this at home, you only will see this if you use like a dev or Canary version. But it hopefully hits beta soon. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is kind of a work in progress. We are we are pushing the, the last touches to, to it. Uh, we also had to extend it to style tags, for example. So um, the next category of bypasses, uh, which is very interesting, and uh, in my opinion, it goes a little bit beyond uh, CSP. Uh, this is actually a, a very interesting uh, research uh, by some of our colleagues, uh, which I think will be presented uh, soon. Um, the idea is that strict CSP protects against uh, traditional XSS, like reflected XSS, the vast majority of DOM XSS. If you have powerful uh, JavaScript frameworks, libraries, uh, that have some kind of evil-like functionality using a non-script uh, DOM element as a source, uh, then you have a problem. You have a problem not with re not really with non-space policies, but with strict dynamics. So we have a problem with automatically blessing uh, script creation through DOM, JavaScript DOM API, such as create element script. And if you have unsafe eval, also that. Uh, I'll explain in more detail what it means. So if you have some, some library that parses, for example, uh, let's say you have jQuery. In jQuery, you can call dot .html and you can pass some HTML to assign some HTML to an element. Uh, you can pass a script. But uh, as you know, if you pass script to dot inner HTML, that does not work because it is parser inserted and the script does not trigger. So j jQuery authors wanted to be as easy as possible uh, to developers, make, make developers' life as easy as possible. So they said, well, if the developer is adding a script tag, so it's doing dot HTML script alert one script, well, he probably wants the script to execute. So what I do instead, I will not use inner HTML, but I will create element script, I will add dot text of the parsed JavaScript, and then I will append it to the body, or I will eval it directly. So the problem here is that browsers are CSP aware, but libraries in general are not. 
So if your library is powerful enough to do some kind of JavaScript parsing and uh, getting sources from uh, no, script, no script tags, for example, from a meta tag or from a, I don't know, like an attribute JS action or something, then you might need to patch your library to make CSP aware and enforce, for example, nonce checking um, at runtime. So this is, for example, jQuery. This is an example uh, from GitHub. Uh, so this is the global evil uh, function. The global evil method uh, is called when a script is detected in a basically .html or .append or .replace with. So basically any DOM manipulation function that modifies the HTML of, a, of an element. So code is JavaScript, okay? It's already being parsed and this is JavaScript. So we have indirect eval, so indirect is eval. Uh, you, we trim the code, if the code is there, we check that if there is use strict uh, with offset one in the code, which is, you know, Atmosphere 6 uh, strict mode, then let's not use eval, but create element script, add, populate the script with the code and add it to the head. Well, to the parent node of the head. And then remove it. Okay, so this is pretty bad because this is a strict dynamic bypass. Because strict dynamic, so jQuery is nonced, right? So it's allowed execution. And this is um, dynamic script creation. Otherwise, it just evils it. So for evil, you need unsafe evil, which if you can avoid doing, uh, using it, putting it the policy, of course, your policy will be better. Uh, just to reiterate, this is not a nonce based CSP bypass, it's a strict dynamic bypass, not a nonce based. So with nonces, this would not run, and this would not run unless there is unsafe evil. How we patch jQuery at Google, we don't use jQuery at Google, but um, we, we normally, uh, we use it for some marketing pages and some internal tools, and what we decide to do is to just neuter it by throwing an error, you should not be here. Uh, we actually did something uh, before doing that. We added some reporting functionalities that sent a CSP violation report so that we could use our CSP frontend to um, actually see what's going on, find which products were using jQuery with this path, and then we just neutered the branch. You. So wrapping up everything, uh, get your questions ready. Basically, we discussed that the whitelist based CSPs are broken by design and usually you should not use them. Um, there's only very few edge cases where they make sense. Um, at Google at least, like the nonsense plus strict dynamic really heavily simplified the CSP rollout and it is probably, yeah, also making lives of other developers a lot easier. Um, also very important to highlight here, like the CSP is not a silver bullet. It is like a defense and depth, me depth mechanism. And there are bypasses, but they usually have various preconditions that have to be met and constraints. So overall CSP is still a very powerful mitigation, but you have to know how to use it. And um, yeah, with that, thanks for your attention. And feel free to ask like any questions if you have some. Wow, thank you very much, Michaela and Lucas. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? Yes, excellent. <clears throat> okay, so um, I've noticed in your slide you have like um, a CSP validator with the known bugs list, right? Uh, yes. So I was wondering, do you guys have, um, or if, if you publish maybe the um, list of uh, how to exploit these um, known bugs, because I noticed you have like a red exclamation mark that says that yes. this is vulnerable to uh, XSS using JSON PA and pointers. Okay. So uh, thanks for the question. So first, um, the CSP evaluator is, is open source, so you actually can copy it and reuse it. It comes with like a list of like, I don't know, 100 or 500 most common whitelist bypasses we extracted from the search index. Um, usually this list is enough to bypass most uh, whitelist based policies because like all the CDNs have the bypasses, right? And uh, also the paper really describes in detail how these bypasses work and how you can find bypasses yourself basically. It's uh, not rocket science, it's just like JSON endpoints you have to find in the domain and fiddle in some 
the right parameters, and then that usually works. So that, I mean, but the idea is that uh, when you use a whitelist-based policy for a script, uh, um, you trust that you can't, that an attacker can't control what that origin sends out. So you, you, you are basically uh, uh, hoping that the, the, the origin, you're trusting the full origin. So if you have JSONP that is basically a proxy for your content, you just do callback your code, that origin sends back yeah. arbitrary code, and then you bypass And that the violates the, the first assumption that first you, assumption, yes. the origin is trusted, right? right. Yep. And this one question over there. Uh, thank, thank for your talk. I'm looking forward to seeing the uh, the applications in the open source uh, um, repositories. Uh, I was wondering if you also investigated um, other media types um, in your CSP, like Flash, JPEG, movies, and so on. So Flash is a very interesting problem, and you're right. You can you also use Flash to trigger XSS, and it is also a CSP bypass. But this is why we have object source none, which basically blocks all Flash content by default, right? So by se setting object default source to none, we block Flash. And uh, JPEG themselves, I mean, or images, they usually cannot trigger JavaScript. And if so, you probably have something that you would still have to put into a script tag, right? And at this point, the browser still prevents the script tag and itself from executing. Yes, the mime sniffing problems that used to be in the past are not longer present, basically modern browsers that support CSP. And anyway, when there is a script, this is subject to script SRC. So even if you're able somehow to get, to get execute a script, it's subject to script SRC policy. It's at a lower level in the, uh, um, browser logic. Oh, yes, uh, thank you. The um, CSP evaluator, does it also uh, perform multiple requests to uh, validate if the nuance is actually uh, regenerated each time instead of uh, being a constant variable? Uh, well, being constant. Uh, the question was if it checks if the nuances, for example, are constant, if it does multiple yeah, requests. If they're random enough. Um, Currently not, there's a feature request for it, but currently it only does one fetch and tries to get the policy. Uh, it's very simple, but this is definitely something we should be doing because uh, this is a very important point. People kind of copy and paste the slides, right? And then they have a constant nonce. And I mean, yeah, it's very trivial to buy perhaps something like that. And yeah, but so thanks. So when we, when we uh, decided to use random with R4 and D0M for the first time in our slides, we are presenting that like uh, two years or even more. Uh, yeah, it's two years. Uh, we were saying in one or two years, we are gonna like check the web if people are using random, like yeah. static random string in, in, the, in the nonce attributes. Uh, we haven't done it yet. But, but we, we should probably, We yeah. should just for, I'm for the I'm pretty sure people copy the slide one to one. So regarding your front end, you mentioned that there is 50 million uh, amounts of noise, and then you kind of want to uh, here are some of the ways to reduce the noise by looking up common signatures. For the other meat of those 50 million, uh, can you share some of the strategies you use to actually get rid of some of the not false positives, some of the actual uh, reports? So uh, basically, you still try to group them by like the important fields, right? Like where do they come from, from, from which domain? And then maybe also by script sample. So you, in the end, you maybe end up with like five script sample lines, and then we usually take them and look into our internal code search and try to s verify that this is actually code that is from us, right? And by that, we can very easily tell if this is something that is broken in, on our side. And we also take the same snippet often and search, just put in a Google search. And then sometimes, you know, you see pages with that or extensions, and then you know it's a false positive. So at this stage, it becomes a bit manual, right? But uh, it's not so bad anymore because um, there is a couple of violation uh, extensions that are very noisy, and as soon as you can filter them out, the data is much, much more actionable, actually, right? But you're right, it is uh, still some work left. And what we also do is uh, we kind of keep monitoring the, the volume of these less like, like of these filtered results, right? And if they, for example, spike 
that could be a regression and then uh, we can alert on that, right? Because it could be that the developer from one day of the other like submits some code that has like, you know, inline JavaScript or inline event handlers or it's like non-sync disabled or whatever, that we would immediately see a spike in the violations, right? And we could act on, on top of that. And yeah, I, don't, I hope this answers the question to some extent. Thank you, any other questions from the floor? No? Um, all right, great. Um, thank you so much. For thank you. you very much, Lucas, Michaeling.